And I don't know okay. if you know this, but you know, the future is going to be bugs. That is what your generation is going to be eating in the future. So, um, you know, might as well get on the <laughs> on the train now. Welcome to Nature's Guardians. I'm Micah Siegel. Each week, I talk with people working to save and help animals around the world. They are nature's guardians, and you can become one too. Today, I'm talking with Tim Epley of Wildlife Madagascar, which is right here on the globe. Welcome to the show, Tim. Thanks for having me. Yeah, pleasure to have you. That was so cringy. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so about Madagascar. Tell us about the history and the animals and the community of Madagascar um, over time. Yeah, so uh, Madagascar, it, it's a really an incredible place. So Madagascar is the fourth largest island in the world. Madagascar is located off the southeast coast of mainland Africa, and mm -hmm. it's about the size of California, uh, to give you an idea. And the current population there is uh, about 28, 29 million people. So a little bit bigger than the, the size of greater Los Angeles. I, I believe around 188 million years ago, um, Madagascar split away from Africa and it continued to drift into the Indian Ocean. And then eventually it split away from the Indian subcontinent. Um, and at that time, there were uh, some similar plants that existed between them, but then speciation of uh, the arrival of mammals and uh, some reptiles and birds, that all happened later. Um, so they all came, um, you know, from around 88 million years ago, 40 million years ago, 60 million years ago. So there were these independent uh, migrations that occurred where the animals um, landed on Madagascar, uh, likely through um, like uh, vegetation rafts that basically, yeah. so vegetation kind of assembles and it gets stuck together in rivers and it shoots out into the ocean and animals may be on there, maybe they're hibernating and then they land in Madagascar, they wake up and uh, they go about their day and uh, and then they speciate from there. So you end up with, um, from single colonizers to Madagascar, you end up with um, sometimes hundreds of different species. And that's what actually happened with lemurs. Tell us about your book on lemurs. I am one of many co-authors of the newest edition of the Lemurs of Madagascar book, um, which is a wonderful reference guide uh, for anyone that's interested in Madagascar and lemurs. And it tells the, it's a, it's a thick book too, um, but it goes over every species, every subspecies that we have uh, of lemur and their conservation issues and uh, conservation programs, where you can best see them, um, so general tourist information as well as just their information about their natural history. We had lemurs that were the size of gorillas uh, that used to exist. Um, unfortunately, once humans arrived, uh, they would have hunting camps. And so those larger species uh, died out and went extinct pretty quickly. But Madagascar was one of the last places to be colonized by humans. And so those large species you know, they only just died out maybe between 20,000 years ago and up until as recent as maybe 500 or 400 years ago. And so that include those large lemurs, include uh, Madagascar hippos, elephant birds uh, that were the largest birds, the largest ratites. Um, so some really crazy individuals. So Madagascar, uh, it's not just the lemurs, but there's obviously this just incredible biodiversity. Um, and Madagascar is known as a biodiversity hotspot. So over 90% of the species that are found there are endemic uh, to Madagascar, meaning they're found nowhere else in the world. Um, so you have a, a, the majority of chameleon species in the world are found in Madagascar. You have painted mantellas that are very similar to uh, poison dart frogs. You have Europlatus, you have, uh, which are these uh, leaf-tailed geckos, which are masters of disguise. They're very well camouflaged against the trunks of trees. Just a lot of uh, incredible stuff. Um, so that we don't need, we won't talk about that. Won't talk about, well, yeah, we won't talk about that. Um, so like I was saying earlier, um, I know this picture is a little bit grainy, but um, since uh, humans arrived on Madagascar, um, or maybe even just before then, uh, due to different environmental changes, um, a number of lemur species have gone extinct 
Um, so we have had 17 lemur species go extinct that we have subfossil records for, and all of them were larger than the lemurs that we know of today. Uh, and so that included lemurs that were the size of gorillas walking around, uh, which is just uh, just incredible. It, it must have been such a bizarre thing to see a, a lemur, uh, a primate that's the size of a gorilla, but on Madagascar and, you know, probably more um, olfactory oriented. Um, it must have been pretty cool. Of those 112 different lemur species, 98% of them are endangered. Um, some of them only have maybe a dozen individuals um, that are left in the wild. Uh, there's 46 uh, species that are endangered, and then there's 26 species that are uh, listed as vulnerable. One of the, I'll, I'll just go through these really quickly um, for you, okay? Um, so first we have mouse lemur, or the Kirigalidae family, and this is dwarf lemurs, mouse lemurs, fork marked lemurs, hairier dwarf lemurs. Um, these are the smallest, one of these, the, uh, I believe it's the Microsavius myosinus, is the smallest primate in the world. So it weighs 30 grams. So it's just, it can fit in the palm of your hand. Very, very small. Uh, especially when you compare that to a gorilla, uh, which is, you know, another primate that is, is huge. Um, so these guys are um, small, they're very fast. They can be anywhere in the low canopy, high canopy, uh, fork marked lemurs, the picture in the middle there, they um, they focus on feeding on gums uh, on the trees. Um, so they're, um, yeah, so they have a very uh, energy rich diet. Um, uh, probably the coolest thing about these guys is that the dwarf lemurs hibernate um, for uh, about four months out of the year. So that's a unique thing to primates. Uh, they're the only primate that hibernates. and. So between May and September, uh, these animals will get, uh, well, usually March, April, and May, these animals will feed on a lot of uh, very nutrient-rich foods. They'll get really, really fat, and then they'll uh, find a burrow in the a tree hole, a hibernaculum, and they'll crawl in there, and then they'll sleep. They'll hibernate for four months. Um, and so we won't see them or hear them during that time. Uh, so it's really kind of cool. And mouse lemurs do something that's kind of similar. Um, they'll bulk up before the austral winter, uh, but then they'll do, uh, they'll utilize something called torpor. And so they'll be awake maybe every seven to nine days. And during those interim periods, they'll kind of slow uh, their heartbeat and they'll, uh, they'll slow their metabolism a bit um, and just rest. What's with the glowing eyes? Well, because they're nocturnal, um, they have what's called a tapetum lucidum, which is a reflective layer uh, in their eye, and that allows them to see at night. Um, so the reason that they're glowing in these photos is because when you're taking a photo of one at night, you know, the flash will bounce off of the, the eye, uh, off of the tapetum, and that's what we capture. It also makes it really easy when you're um, if you're a tourist or if you're a researcher and you're surveying an area or you're you're walking through the forest at night and you have a headlamp um, and you're looking around in the trees, you'll first see that eye shine um, and that'll alert you that there's a lemur there and then you can go and check it out. Um, and so mm -hmm. it makes it easy. It's the same thing here in the U.S. If you go outside with a headlamp at night, you may see a raccoon eyes shining back at you. Maybe deer eyes will shine back at you, bear, uh, possums, all of those. Uh, so it's the same, uh, the same retinal traits that they have. Um, so the next uh, group that we have, the next family is the Lepilemuridae. Uh, these are the sportive lemurs. There's 26 species and you can see that map in the middle um, how diverse the Lepilemuridae family is. Um, and it's really incredible. So any of the little forest fragments that you go to, you're likely to see a new species, um, you know, that's gonna be different from uh, another fragment that you travel to. Uh, and so it's really, it, it's really quite incredible. But there are some species of them like uh, Septrianalis up in the north that, you know, there's less than a hundred individuals in the wild. Um, and for many of these species, we only have 
um, single genetic samples uh, to identify it. So there's a lot of areas in between where there could be even more species. Um, you know, back in the 90s, there were only uh, between 40 and 50, 40 and 60 lemur species that were uh, had been identified, and then uh, a lot more genetic testing um, throughout the last 30 years, and that's uh, produced uh, a huge increase up to 112 lemur species. And maybe in the next 20 years, we'll have another 30 or 40 more as we continue to do genetic testing in areas that haven't been previously surveyed or researched. So then we have lemuridae, which is uh, probably the, the most um, familiar of lemur families. Uh, this includes the ring-tailed lemurs, uh, which you see at a lot of zoos, and they're in a lot of um, a, a lot of stuff. Uh, so you see them all over social media, um, very photogenic. Um, uh, but it also includes the bamboo lemurs, the brown lemurs, black lemurs, uh, rough lemurs. Uh, so it's it's quite a diverse family, um, and they're all about cat size, small dog size. Um, you know, and they, they're, a lot of them are cathemeral as well. And so cathemeral means that they have a, um, intermediate retinal, uh, traits so that they can be awake during the day and at night. And they may change their activity pattern based on when they are, um, uh, when, when the fruits or when foods, uh, preferred food items are available to them. Um, and so they may not, uh, yeah, they, they may not just be awake during the day, but you may hear them, uh, you know, above your tent if you're sleeping in the forest. You may hear them uh, feeding above you in the middle of the night. What's a shifaka? So the shifak is part of the Indridae family. So that's the next family um, I'm going to talk about. And that is the woolly lemurs, the shifak, and the Indri. And the Indri are the largest uh, member, uh, the largest living lemur. Um, and so these are really, these are larger bodied uh, lemurs. So they're about five to, you know, seven kilos. Um, so quite large. They, they, um, uh, they're they also polyvorous. They, they feed on a lot of leaves. They sometimes feed on uh, fruits. Um, the, the woolly lemurs are awake during the night. So they're the nocturnal species. Um, so the ones on the, the left here. Uh, that photo. And then the injury is the one on the right. And then in the middle is the diadem shafak, uh, which is the one that I was saying is probably among the most beautiful primates in the world. Um, and so shafak are um, quite uh, quite diverse. There's nine different species of them. Um, and so we have them in the eastern rainforest. We have them in the northwest where there's more dry um, uh De deciduous forest, and then even down in the southwest where there's the spiny desert, you can find the Varro Um, And what makes these guys really cool is that they are vertical, they're known as vertical clinger and leapers. Uh, so they have very long legs and shorter arms. And so they typically will kind of uh, attach themselves to a tree trunk, and then they can launch themselves really far distances to get to the next tree. And in areas where there are uh, more degraded environments, or maybe there's fragmented habitat, the animals will descend to the ground and then they'll dance across uh, the ground because they have these really long legs. And so they kind of do this skipping motion, um, uh, kind of like a shuffle almost uh, to get between the two fragments. So uh, the nocturnal species eat yeah. um, a lot of insects and a lot of fruit, um, at least for the Kiragalidae family. So the dwarf lemurs, the mouse lemurs, um, they feed on a lot of fruits, they feed on a lot of insects, and then the fork marked lemurs, they feed on um, a lot of gums. So they'll, they'll chew into uh, the tree trunk or a tree branch, and they'll wait until the, the tree um, gums start to run, like a sap starts to run from the tree, and then they'll lick that. Uh, and then our, our largest nocturnal lemur um, is the Ayai, uh, which is the fifth lemur family, the Dabatonidae. And there's only one genus, one species, so it's the II Dabatania uh, madagascariensis. Um, and you may have seen these in zoos. I think there's a few zoos in the U.S. that still have them. Um, even though they're quite uh, spread around Madagascar, you can see that range map there on the right. 
that they're all throughout the eastern rainforest and even in the west. Um, they are listed as endangered because, and they probably should be critically endangered because they're they're solitary. Um, they have huge home ranges, and we still don't know much about them. Um, they they travel quite fast. They can travel these large distances. Um, not many people see them, um, and so it's very difficult to obtain data about their um, uh, their genetically how their populations are doing. Uh, we just don't know much, but um, they're fascinating species. Species uh, they they're you know, they have a long uh, digit uh, that they use to tap along uh, the tree trunk and they'll listen for um, hollow areas and they're looking for larva or bugs that have kind of uh, um, burrowed themselves in there and they'll gnaw at the bark to get that off to extract that larva from the tree trunk. Uh, so it's a really, uh, it, they've basically fulfilled the ecological niche of a woodpecker in Madagascar because Madagascar doesn't have any woodpeckers. So they've been able to exploit that um, to um, feed on those, um, that, that resource. Tell us about the predators, the fossa, fusa, I'm not sure. Fusa, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so in Malagasy, the o this is a camera trap photo of a fusa, um, but it's, uh, you know, a little blurry because camera traps can only go so fast, but, uh, Fusa are part of the Eupluridae family, uh, which are, uh, and it's an endemic family to Madagascar of small carnivores, and Fusa being the largest of them. They're kind of like a medium-sized dog, and they have a long tail, and they can, um, they can travel on the ground, they're terrestrial, but they can also be arboreal, so they can chase lemurs uh, through, through the tree canopy. Um, and so they can be highly effective predators. That long tail allows them to really balance well on, um, on branches in the canopy. What family are they in? So they're not cats. They're, they're not, not cats. Yeah. So they yeah. are, uh, they are the Eupluridae Ur family, which is just Malagasy carnivores. So it's made up of Fusa, Malagasy civets, um, an animal called the Phalanuk, uh, which is a um, an interesting animal with a very uh, thin face and a very bushy tail. Uh, and then it also inclu includes Vonsira. And Vonsira are a, uh, a type of Malagasy mongoose. Uh, and they're all kind of within that mongoose family. Uh, they're their own unique thing. Tell us about habitat destruction in Madagascar. Well, um, habitat destruction in Madagascar, it's, uh, it's variable. I mean, it's happening at a large scale um, across both the eastern rainforest, the dry deciduous forest, um, in the central highlands, and even in the spiny desert. And each region, it's a little bit different. Where we have large populations of um, humans, um, they're uh, cutting down forests to create um, uh, to expand their agriculture lands, uh, to, uh, to expand their graze lands for the livestock like goats, sheep, uh, zebu, which is a, uh, an African form of a, a cattle. Um, and then uh, there are other areas that are being uh, cleared for more commercial farming, like peanut farming, um, where they're just wiping out baobabs and um, other uh, other more dry forest species that take a very long time to grow. Uh, so that's very, um, very detrimental. Um, but yeah, that process of um, habitat destruction, um, you know, first you're, first you're clearing the land, then when the trees come down, you're cutting planks and those planks will go towards making furniture, or they'll go towards making homes. A lot of people are used, need materials to build their homes or build furniture so they need the trees for that um the, un, the unusual shaped um uh wood you know uh the large branches or whatnot those will be used for making charcoal so the majority of the population in madagascar uh still cook over a fire um and so charcoal uh, will last a little bit longer than just using um uh um, dried wood how how are you guys dealing with this because people aren't 
you're, you can't just make people give up building houses and cooking food. Right. So how do you approach this? You can't blame the Malagasy people for wanting to eat and to build homes and to take care of their family. Um, and so as a conservationist, we're trying to develop strategies that can create sustainable development and create, um, you know, create alternatives um, for these families that are living close to the protected areas. Protected areas and national parks and, and the lemurs and the wildlife within it um, should be something that those families can rely on for income. Um, you know, it's going to be more sustainable in the long term to have these things in their in their area, you know, through tourism. Um, and it, it should be uh, it should be great. But at the moment, we have minimal tourism in a lot of areas. And so people kind of turn towards, yeah, towards, uh, you know, destroying the forest or using the forest, using those resources that are uh, right next to them. We also, um, we also work with an organization to bring secondary uh, to a lot of families. And secondary are a type of plant hopper bug that will actually live on bean plants and they, they'll eat the aphids. And so it's beneficial to the bean plants for these species, these secondary, these bugs to live on them. Um, and they're fast, fast to reproduce. Uh, they have a lot of vitamins and minerals. They have high protein content um, and they taste great. Uh, and I, I realize that, you know, a lot of people, you know, are like, ah, oh, bugs, that's kind of gross, but it's, it's true. They taste like bacon. And you can look it up on the internet. We've, uh, my uh, colleague, Dr. Courtney Borgerson has um, written a number of pieces about them. Um, and a lot of the Malagasy communities that we've brought these to um, are all in on it. They may be skeptical for the first couple of minutes, but then when they see us eat them and when we cook them up and we show them uh, how to prepare them, uh, they're like, oh, these are, these are really tasty. This is really good. And so it's a nice alternative and it, it doesn't, completely take over, you know, it's not providing them with 100% of their daily protein needs, but, you know, even that small percent, 20 to 30% of their daily need, um, that may be the difference in saving a lemur's life. I mean, I'm not, that's, that's like one of the things I would do if there was like no food, if I was like starving, and I was gonna die in 10 minutes, I'd eat bugs, even if it tastes like bacon. Um, but yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Even just like, Fried up with a little bit of oil and a little salt. Uh, yeah, they're uh, they're a nice treat, nice snack. And I don't okay. know if you know this, but you know the future is gonna be bugs. That is what your generation is gonna be eating in the future. So uh, you know, might as well get on the <laughs> on the train now. Tell us about the tortoises and their trafficking situation. Um, radiated tortoises, plowshare tortoises. Um, and some others, yeah, they end up being um, illegally taken from a lot of national parks and um, a lot of their natural habitats, and especially when they're babies. And so sometimes you'll see news reports um, from the, the national airport, uh, the, the airport in Ivatu, uh, in Antananarivo, where, you know, 5,000 tortoises were confiscated or 10,000 tortoises were confiscated. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's tragic. It's awful. Um, but once those animals, if they, if they are discovered, if they are confiscated, uh, there's a number of rescue centers, uh, throughout Madagascar where they can work on quarantining those animals, uh, making sure that they're healthy and that there's no diseases, um, that are spreading between them and then work towards reintroducing them to the wild, um, back to their native habitat. And so, there's places in Northwest Madagascar where that occurs with the plowshares. Uh, and then there's um, a number of places for the radiated tortoises in the South. Um, and I believe there's even something like 5,000 radiated tortoises that are, uh, they're prepping for reintroducing uh, over the coming months. Um, so that would be really great. If we go in a time machine, uh, go to the future in 30 years and go to Madagascar, what does it look like? What do you think it will be? Ooh, that is a great question. Um, well, I would hope that there's been probably, I would hope that there had been a big change over that time period due to the efforts of 
um, my organization, my colleagues' organizations, and uh, and the global public in general uh, that will have a lot of reforestation. We'll maybe have larger. We'll be seeing the efforts of those reforestation. Um, uh, programs and seeing larger buffer zones around the national parks. We'll see better law enforcement. Um, we'll see more programs devoted to those populations that are living nearby. We'll see successful and thriving um, populations of humans um, that are living near national parks that are, you know, really, um, uh, you know, that are successful from tourism, increased tourism throughout the island. We'll see better infrastructure. We'll see better roadways, um, probably due to increased tourism. Um, it's always been my hope that, uh, you know, Madagascar with all of its diversity and endemism and uh, the uniqueness of it, it, Madagascar is often referred to as the eighth continent because of that, because it's, it's truly uh, an incredible place. And so there's this incredible potential for tourism and for people, you know, naturalists that want to go there and, uh, you know, people that just even want to go on a vacation to the beach. Uh, there's beautiful beaches there. You know, they don't even have to be interested in the wildlife. Um, there's a lot of opportunity there. And there's no reason that Madagascar can't be like Costa Rica. You know, Costa Rica back in the 70s uh, was largely... Uh, deforested, there was a lot of agriculture, and then they decided to change things around. They were going to focus on ecotourism. They were going to focus on creating a green belt that would stretch from the north side of the country to the south side and create a giant corridor. And they put that in action at every level of the government um, and in society, and it really paid off. And now there are, you know, there's thousands of expats that'll go to live there and start businesses and there's so much ecotourism and communities around those areas where ecotourism exists are thriving and so we need we need more development like that in Madagascar where all levels of society can benefit from it um, and that in turn will help to benefit the wildlife and the native the natural environment thank you so much for talking with me today tim and thank you for watching you can help animals by hitting the like button and subscribing to this channel I'll see you next time on Nature's Guardians talking about Flor Floridian manatees with Thierry Friedrich. So stay tuned for that. Thank you so much. Bye.